Welcome to the 75th anniversary of NASA Ames Research Center Director's Colloquium Summer Series. Today's seminar is by Dr. Raj Venkatapathy and is titled Mary Poppins' Approach to Human Mars Mission Entry, Descent, and Landing. Every NASA spacecraft that has entered another planet's atmosphere or returned to land on Earth uses technologies developed at NASA Ames Research Center. As we expand our vision of space exploration, a stowable, compact entry system that is scalable is essential for both manned and unmanned missions. Today's talk will discuss a novel entry, descent, and landing system called ADEPT. Raj is the chief technologist for the Entry System and Technology Division at NASA Ames Research Center. He is also the project manager for the game-changing Thermal Protection System Materials Development Project and the co-inventor of ADEPT. Prior to joining NASA Ames Research Center, he was the president and director of research for Alarat Corporation. He received his doctoral degree from Iowa State University on the development and application of a computational fluid dynamics uh, solvers to predict hypersonic flow around the shuttle orbiter. Please join, join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Venkatapathy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Dr. Klein. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of the summer series, especially the 75th anniversary uh, director's colloquium here. The speakers that are going to follow this summer are very great uh, people, accomplished people, and it's very, uh, I'm very honored to be here. I'm talking to all of you, especially my colleagues that are here, that have been living this uh, story I'm going to tell you. And uh, without much, I've been asked to give a little bit about myself first. So I was born in India uh, in a city called Madras. And I did my undergraduate uh, degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, and then I came to US. I don't know how many of you know where Iowa is and Ames is. And uh, so I thought I'll show a a little video of where Madras is. That's where I came. Des Moines is the capital of Iowa State, and Iowa State University is very close to Des Moines. And Ames, Iowa, and NASA Ames had a traditional connection in an area called computational fluid dynamics. That's where I specialized. And uh, I worked at uh, Langley Research Center for a year after I graduated, and uh, I love hiking, backpacking, photography, and also eating good food. Over the years, I've gained some weight. I'm told uh, that I need to think about. So I'll go back to hiking and uh, backpacking. I love photography. And uh, Yosemite is one of my favorite places. And. Uh, Hawaii is another favorite place to be on the beach with my wife, who is here somewhere. We have been married for 29 years, and that's uh, pretty much about myself. The title of the talk, Mary Poppins' Approach. If you are born in the last century, you would know Mary Poppins. And I don't know how many of you that are here today are born this century. And uh, it's a great story for children, imagination. Uh, and if you see her, at the end of the talk, you'll know why I selected this as the topic for a conversation today. Mars, that's also an amazing place, amazing story unfolding for centuries. And that's a picture of Mars that you see the frosty white clouds, ice clouds, and the dusty storm it was taken by Hubble Telescope in 2004. And we have learned a lot of 
from the rovers that are roving around Mars today. Very quickly, last century, it, it's very interesting to think of myself as I was born in last century and I'm in this century now working on things. The last century, humans left the surface of Earth. First airplane to all the way to going, on, going to the moon. We're all accomplished. And then we built the space station. Human presence expanded into near Earth orbit. Still the gravity well was keeping us too close to Earth. Mars. <clears throat> we were successful after many trials and errors to put orbiter on Mars, and then we put landers. Between 1976 and 97, there was a period where we didn't think about Mars because we were building the space shuttle and space station, and all our funding went towards those two. Then starting 97, 96 or so, we started exploring Mars again. And this century, we landed multiple rovers. Uh, the MER, the two twin rovers, Phoenix, and Curiosity. I think most of you have seen the movie, The Seven Minutes of Terror about Curiosity landing on Mars. I will cover part of that in my talk, but that was a great accomplishment. All of that is in preparation for humans going to Mars in the longer term. On the human side, shuttle was retired, and it was uh, because I worked on shuttle before shuttle flew about hypersonic flow, that was not a great day personally for me. But hopefully our uh, presence in space will expand beyond low Earth orbit in the near future. And I am very, very blessed to be working on those things. So that's what the stock is going to be. So I'm going to describe essentially what are the challenges for human exploration in specifically connected with Mars. I'll show you a couple of the concepts that NASA is working on. And I'll focus mostly on one concept that we are developing here. Uh, Ames is taking the leadership of that concept development. It involves other NASA centers as well. And human exploration of Mars is a long journey, really, not just physical time, but also in terms of funding and technologies and so on. So the concept will also be, is being explored for other applications. I'll cover them, and I'll end the talk. Uh, our center director, the motivation, really, the, the vision for Mars exploration. Periodically, we visit them, we reaffirm that, and here's a couple of people that you all recognize, and uh, if I can get this. I should have practiced before. Uh, okay. I think I'm forgetting this out. Figure out whether there's life other places in the solar system. But more fundamentally, what we're all about at NASA is figuring out how to extend human presence in the solar system. And if we, our administrator. Robotic spacecraft and rovers are already on and around Mars dramatically increasing our knowledge about the Red Planet and paving the way for future human explorers. Future missions seeking signs of past life will demonstrate new technologies that can help astronauts survive on Mars. I think some of the most amazing things that we're learning are actually how to be really good detectives on another planet, which is a really difficult job. Engineers and scientists around the country are working hard to develop the technologies astronauts will use to one day live and work on Mars and then safely return home from the next giant leap for humanity. Through advanced aerospace technologies used in everything from modern aircraft to suborbital rockets and the commercial vehicles servicing low Earth orbit today, we're building a machines to take us farther into the high frontier. NASA is here to raise the bar for human achievement. We're a community dedicated to research and discovery in service to society. We have a responsibility to the future generations, to, to the future generations of engineers, scientists, technologists, explorers. That's our challenge. 
So in some sense, those vision statements are very important for us to first believe in them, and then how do we achieve them? <clears throat> when we look at realizing the vision stated by leadership, uh, we see a lot of challenges. We hear about human Mars missions in the newspaper, periodically about how expensive it's going to be, whether there's political support or not. Beyond those, there's also technical challenges. That's primarily the sense of this talk. Technical challenges, if you look at in the big picture, interplanetary travel, especially for humans, uh, it's not very well uh, understood. We have lived in the station for extended period of time. Uh, station is uh, somewhat protected from the deep space radiation. And if you look at entry, descent, landing, which is I'm going to talk about and show you why it's a big challenge, that's another. And survival at the surface, when you get there, you really have to carry all the resources. That means a amount of uh, mass you have to carry with you or ahead of the human presence. Those are all challenges. And then any explorer, if they don't return back to the origin of where they started their journey from, they don't get to tell the story. So we've got to bring the astronauts back safely. And that's another challenge as well. And the NASA vision today, as stated by our administrator, by NASA, is really the near Earth, uh, uh, our ability to be in space is going to be done by commercial uh, crew, uh, commercial entities, COTS program. But going beyond Earth vicinity, the plans are to mature, as you see, missions that are being planned is in the order of months to be out there and come back. And then we ought to get ready for Mars. And Mars missions will be two to three year long. Uh, we need to demonstrate technologies that are gonna carry us towards Mars by doing technology demonstration and so on and so forth. So the current plan is evolving. It's constrained by budget and so on and so forth. But our job, I believe, as part of this center, part of NASA, is to address those technical challenges. So question, we have done amazing things. We brought back astronauts from the moon, and that was entry, descent, landing. You had to come through the planet Earth atmosphere. You have to descend, slow down, and then land safely. And then we built shuttle, which is a lifting body like an airplane. It generates lift, and we ferried millions of pounds back and forth to the station with astronauts on board safely. So what's the challenge of Mars? Well, why is it Mars? So I have two good friends and colleagues of mine that are, that can that have explained this challenge of what is, why Mars is so difficult in this video. One of the greatest challenges is figuring out how to take the humans and fly them safely through the atmosphere down to the surface. The air is so thin on Mars that the vehicles don't slow down to a point where you can light your engines below the speed of sound. That's a big problem, and how we might solve that is to use very large, potentially very large heat shields or aeroshells, things that actually use the air it pushes on to slow down. We've done this for robotic missions, but we've done it at a very small scale. And it's very hard to extrapolate those technical solutions to the large scale of human exploration where we're basically talking about landing two-story houses on the surface of Mars, one right next to each other. The other challenge, of course, is coming back to Earth. Now, we, you can imagine we can put people in a space capsule as they arrive to Earth and directly land on Earth like we do coming back from the moon. Well, that's exactly the idea. However, you're coming back much faster. The heating rates are massively high, even though the vehicle is quite a bit smaller than landing on Mars. It's still a huge problem. As, as you know, most of you may know, that Ames Research Center specializes in thermal protection system. We invented most of the TPS materials that flew on shuttle. Stardust is another, uh, the PICA material, and that's what has uh, helped SpaceX to achieve what they have so far. And, and those in, involvements are very well known, but our involvement entry system, entire system of getting, that's not, and that's gonna be part of this talk. As mentioned in these, the challenge of Mars entry, descent, landing is primarily because the atmosphere of Mars is so thin. I've shown here is the 
uh, atmospheric density profile as a function of altitude, but the density is plotted in log scale. <clears throat> the red is Mars atmospheric density, the blue is Earth, and then Venus is in the dark uh, a black dotted line. You'll see that the Mars density at the surface of Mars compared to Earth is 1% of Earth density. So throughout its atmosphere, if you're descending with the same size vehicle, you won't get much drag. That means you're not slowing down. That means Mars is coming at you very, very fast. So what do we do about it? That's the challenge. I'm going to come back to Venus later on. Venus's uh, surface density is 100 bars, 100 times the atmosphere, and the surface temperature is 450 degrees or higher in terms of centigrade. So the two planets that are surrounding us have such a vast difference in terms of atmospheric composition, density, and so on and so forth. The concept I'm going to describe later on in a few minutes that are applicable to both these planets. That's the beauty of this concept as well. Challenges for EDL, entry, descent, landing, we have been successful. They help us to understand what do we do next when we scale up to human missions. So I'll play those two entry, descent, landing movies. One is the Pathfinder, the smallest rover. It's a micro rover, 16 kilograms. You know, you can pick it up and not necessarily put it in a backpack, but it's very backpack carryable size. The other one is the Mars Science Laboratory, the lander, uh, that is like a mini Cooper, uh, almost a metric ton. This is the Mars Pathfinder. So what you saw, the landing part with the airbag, if you put a human being there after nine months of journey to Mars, that would be a pretty big challenge. <laughs> so uh, we know in terms of mass, uh, this particular, uh, th this is an event diagram, basically various events that happen. Uh, that's the entry. That's hypersonic, and we are coming at 17,000 miles an hour, around 150,000 feet or so. Between that and the parachute opening, it happens in two minutes. We're slowing down to 1,000 miles an hour. All of this done with that aeroshell, essentially. 2.65 meter diameter aeroshell. And then in the next two minutes, we have done all of these maneuvers and landed, essentially. The micro rover was 16 kilogram, and this is the spacecraft. The spacecraft at this point was 890 kilogram, essentially. I'm sorry, spacecraft right here. This is 570 kilograms. So in the next, I'm gonna show Mars Science Laboratory. I'll show you what the takeoff mass for Mars Science Laboratory was for one metric ton. Then you'll appreciate why a human mission may have to invent new ways of getting to Mars. Uh, you saw this airbag technique would not work for Mars Science Laboratory. And so JPL really had to come up with some very creative ways of how do we land. 
And it just like that slogan, your thigh bone is connected to the hip bone, the landing all the way to entry, not only that, the takeoff from Earth, they're all interconnected. You had to plan every one of those things together in a sequence. Because once you enter Mars surface, you have no control over anything uh, for the pathfinder. Now, Mars Science Laboratory is slightly different, and it has a greater control, but it's autonomous. We don't, we can't control them. So you'll see that in a minute. Imagine Mars as a very dot in the sky. When you leave Earth, you have to point your spacecraft very precisely. The precision, if you have any error, then you're carrying a lot of fuel to correct that. And we, as, we are the only nation to be able to land things on Mars to date. We have perfected that art and the engineering behind it. So we just left planet Earth. And that journey, it's a lonely seven and a half, eight and a half months for MSL. It's in deep space. It's all silent. You don't hear anything in space. You see those weights dropping? Those are dead weights. They're dropped to get lift vector, essentially, so that the center of gravity is a little offset. And you see the reaction control jets firing to orient the lift vector if you want to go left or right. All of that is called guidance navigation control. And Apollo, we did that, and we are doing it again for MSL. All those sounds you heard, they're dropping more dead weights to align itself so the parachute can be deployed. The entire system is dropped, that the lander is dropped on a essentially a, a retro rocket. It has to come down to a very steady stand still, like a hummingbird essentially, and then it's going to drop the rover down. And all of this is done autonomously, but all the things that could go wrong are taken into account. And finally, that last maneuver, they had to take the, the retro propulsion system away so that it doesn't land on top of the rover. So the timeline, if you look at, we are entering Mars very similar. It's a little le lesser speed, entry speed. But the aeroshell was four and a half meter diameter and very similar to the Pathfinder aeroshell. But the thing that happened here was that during the hypersonic part, we did a hypersonic aero maneuvering by tilting the geometry in a way by CG offset so it'll generate lift vector. If you generate lift vector like an airplane in a way that you're taking advantage of the lift to keep the airplane in air for a longer time. Longer time means that Mars is not coming at you as fast, you can decelerate. And we were, we, the landed rover is 900 kilograms, and the launch mass for this is half a million kilograms. 
So imagine the scale, if you want to do human missions, they will be somewhere between 20 metric ton to 40 metric ton, somewhere in that ballpark, not one metric ton. Uh, that's what you have to land, and you can work backwards to start to see that some of them are uh, impossible today with the current technology, even to lift off from the ground. That's why we are, we are building SLS, launch systems, the heavy lift vehicles, and so on, that one day will allow us to throw things at Mars that are needed for human presence. So getting to the surface of Mars uh, requires some significant challenges. We saw between Pathfinder and MSL how things were very different. The largest rocket today we have is five meter diameter. That's the size that we can launch. So Mars being so rarefied in terms of the density, how do we land 40 metric tons? Getting back to Earth is another thing. Uh, Ames is working on both, and I'm lucky enough to be working with people that are here, and towards the end, I'll ask them to stand up. And they are doing on both of these aspects. Uh, going to Mars will not be a single mission. It will be a whole campaign. We have to have resources at the surface. And then once humans get there, the Alignment of Earth and Mars have to happen in such a way that we can get them back in the shortest period of time or with the shortest amount of energy, because we have to leave the gravity well of Mars to come back. So these things would be over a decade. So we have to think in terms of technology, how are these technologies going to be utilized in multiple missions? Some are carrying cargo, some are carrying crew. And also the mass that we will deliver at the surface of Mars could be scalable uh, in the sense you may be doing some at 10 metric ton, others 40 metric ton, depending on what architectures. We haven't yet decided how we're gonna do all that. So any technology we invent today, it has to have certain characteristics. Not a requirement because we don't know what exactly Mars missions are gonna look like. So I call them desirement. It has to be mass efficient. I already showed you why. It has to have a very large drag surface because Mars demands very large drag surface. Pinpoint landing, if you're gonna have a, a, a set of things uh, at Mars for humans to utilize resources, you have to land right next to it, better than MSL landed. That's a big, tall order. And then operational considerations. Uh, there's a maneuver called air capture. You didn't see that, I'm gonna spend a minute or so in the next slide. And then transitions. You saw how an aerosol heat shield has to be deployed, and then you had a transition from hypersonic to a supersonic phase with a parachute, and then to a landing phase. Those transitions are all big challenges when you especially think about very large diameter objects, basically, and heavy masses. And then risk. Uh, even though I think our center director have signed up to go to Mars one-way trip, I don't think too many of us would agree for him to go. Maybe some of some may, but <laughs> the, the, the whole point is we, we as nation, I don't think we would venture into not bringing back our astronauts, especially the ones that touch the surface of Mars the first time. So returning is also a big challenge. Risk posture for those missions is a big challenge. You can't afford to go something go wrong. So how do you design a very complex uh, set up missions, you had to choreograph, expensive. So those are all considerations we have to think about. And then finally, scalability. Uh, aero capture is not very different. It's similar to entry, hypersonic entry. When we call aero capture, that means instead of doing propulsive reduction in velocity, we use the atmosphere to slow down. But we don't go on land, but we come out after we lose a certain amount of kinetic energy, and then put this whole spaceship around the orbit of Mars. Why we want to do that for human Mars mission? Because we want to have astronauts or assets in the sky as the crew on the ground is working away if there is a reason for communication or for risk posture to get back to that out of the Mars surface safely. So it is part of the design we have to think about. Uh, another thing, how good do we know when we design these systems? Uh, the hypersonic aerophysics, the physics based, our ability to simulate, is based on our ability to test. Uh, we have some great facilities. 
that are available to us to understand the physics, and also we get flight data. All of those things are helping. The chart there, I'm not gonna go into it. That's uh, probably for, for people to understand that it's a good graduate school uh, series of lectures. But it kind of tells you when you have to slow down from 17, 20,000 miles an hour in two minutes to almost zero, lots of things happen. Shock, hypersonically shock layer, things radiate, things heat up. You have to care for all of those things. We have those tools that we have a certain amount of uh, confidence in them. We have predicted the entry of the Mars Science Laboratory. We instrumented it. We did very well. So those things give us confidence when you go to larger and larger scale. Now, with that, I'll tell you there are ways in which we can get to Mars and why some of them are impossible and others may be possible. NASA in 2010 uh, completed a study the study was done a year and a half or so. And the study looked at what would it take to land 40 metric ton at the surface of Mars. The phases, different phases are shown here. This is aero capture, hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic, and then landed phase. You can do the entire thing with retro propulsion. If you think you can do it, what would be the amount of fuel you would need to slow down and get to the surface of Mars. And that's what is the very first, uh, this architecture. So you're doing everything propulsively, slowing down. That'll require 265 metric ton when you enter the surface. That's the amount of fuel essentially you're carrying and the engine for uh, slowing down. That's impossible for us to then lift that much mass and throw it at a velocity escaping gravity well of Earth towards Mars and doing all that. So the next scenario is, why don't we use something like shuttle? You need a large surface, you need a lift for guiding precision control flight. So we don't have a Kennedy Space Center on Mars so you can land shuttle-like objects. But you can use it for aero capture, you can do, use it for hypersonic then you need to transition out of that into a retro propulsion mode, essentially. So that's what this middle column is, this guy. So somewhere around supersonically, you transition into retro and go land. That's around 100 metric ton, 110 metric ton. This technology, we know how to do because we've been flying shuttle uh, for all these 30 years or so, and that's doable. Is there any better system? So there are, and the one that the study, particular study looked at is called inflatable. And the inflatables essentially, uh, the Russians tried to develop inflatable technology. I mean, we have been looking at it for many years now. And there's gonna be a test in Hawaii uh, that was supposed to happen last week called LDSD. And it's a supersonic deployable. And that didn't happen, it'll happen very soon. It's the same thing, you hypersonically inflate something, a big balloon, essentially, and that gives you drag during aero capture. You can't reuse it, so you use another uh, uh, inflated device for hypersonic, and then supersonically, you need much larger surface than you do that. So it's a series of inflation devices that may get us 81 metric ton. Uh, sorry about this. Now I come to the concept that we have been working since 2011 or so, we started out. It's a very simple concept for one to think about. All the launch systems have a limitation of how uh, large a shape that you can uh, launch. So if you can think of it, this sits in a shroud. That's what the stowed configuration is. And then, after you've left Earth, either before departure towards a planet or when you come to the surface of the planet, close to it, you can deploy it. It is simply an umbrella concept. The umbrella protects us from rain and sun and all of that. This will allow us to generate drag 
and also the skin, which is very specialized, I will talk about it in a minute, that also protects the rest of the payload from the heating. Because the umbrella is open to the back and the front, a lot of that heating is radiated into space. That's another advantage of this. It's a very simple concept, but when you think about 23 meter diameter or 15 meter diameter, and the amount of load you have to withstand at very high temperatures, they become very challenging to solve those problems. Now the same umbrella, what I showed earlier was a ballistic entry concept, which means that you deploy it and you hold the shape you can enter. This is like Pathfinder. They didn't do any maneuvering. The same concept, when you deploy it, this is a very simplified model, you can move the front surface with respect to your payload. That means if I want to go left or right, I can do that by simply leveraging that. It's like sailboats, essentially, how we do. And that's how we get lift maneuvering part. And then there's another uh, invention, partly, is you think about umbrella flipping in the wind. If you do a controlled flip, you can use those st beefy structures that we have to withstand the entry load. They can be used for landing. So you don't get rid of the umbrella. You make use of the umbrella, essentially, surface. So this movie is going to sh show you What I talked about, deployment, maneuvering, So we can do this design, and we have built models. And I'm going to hurry up. Uh, I don't have much time left, and uh, my apologies. But we have built a series of models here. Later on, you can come and look at them. And an independent study was done last year at the request of uh, the SDMD director, uh, associate administrator. And that study looked at our concept, and they confirmed that the concept is very viable. And uh, the challenge is really is, we don't know how all of these concepts are going to fit into this architecture. So we need to get some refinement. And also, we need to develop these architectures. Before we build 23 meter diameter, we have to be building smaller scale. That was the finding. So we get to Mars somewhere beyond 2035. Not clear whether that's a realistic uh, time period or not, but we need to be working on the technology development now. And in a few years, a decade from now or so, station will, its life expectancy is not to last. So for us, doing the technology development right now is a very important aspect that, that NASA is stressing. So when we look at, before we build a 23 meter, where else could this concept be used? Venus is a place. Uh, we have done Venus many times before. The Russians have, and we have, Pioneer Venus. But entry into Venus, because of its atmosphere again, and the kind of technology we have, it requires, uh, it, during entry, the probe will encounter something like 200 to 650 G, depending on how massive it is, how heavy it is. So this concept can help. And we have been looking at this concept very seriously for the last year and a half or so. And that's a concept for Venus. And this is a movie that shows the, the Venus concept. Uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate made this movie for public uh, release. So that's only six meter diameter. It can land 1,000 kilograms.
So now the heat shield is deployed. Uh, the payload is now going towards the surface of Venus on parachute for a while and then just dropping. The surface of Venus is very thick and gooey, so to say. So the load that this configuration will experience requires some complex mechanical system. You have to deploy them, you have to hold the fabric in tension and all of that. And the ADAPT word is Adaptive Defiable Entry and Placement Technology. That's what its acronym stands for. And this is a carbon fabric. I have a sample here. And uh, if you want to come later, you can take a look at them. And that has gone undergone an extensive testing. So 20 times lower entry heating means we can test these materials in the facility that's available today. We don't have to build new facilities. And drag reduction, order of magnitude, that means that you can use science instruments that we are using today in MSL to investigate more, uh, Venus. You don't have to ruggedize them or do anything to withstand those entry loads. So we started with uh, uh, this concept study. We built a ground test article. And I'll show one quick movie. This article is available if you're interested to see this in its functioning. It's a very simple concept, but you can see some of my colleagues sitting here later on. I'll ask them to stand up. Uh, they are doing the testing. And it's painted white so that we can see how the fabric moves in, in, in during loading. And then we did orchard testing of the carbon fabric. The carbon fabric is the key to the success of this concept. And uh, I'm gonna run this a little, that's a article where we load up the fabric mechanically on, called bidirectional, both directions. And that's a model. And uh, we have tested this. Oops, sorry. Let me. And, and what you will see in this movie, okay, you saw a bit of it. In the arch shed is a place where three, we can two, generate one. the same heat, hot environment of air flowing over models. That's a model, wedge model and the surface of the fabric, that it's a fa woven fabric, three-dimensionally woven, to take all the heat and also the loads at the temperature. And you can see low Opening spots going away. Camera. This oh. went, this test went up to 220 seconds or so. Models at 30 and the seconds. condition at which this was tested, uh, far greater than we would ever need for Mars, human Mars missions, and it's more Venus relevant condition. And the Success of this test combined seconds. with the entire system being mechanical, that's what makes our concept very uh, attractive to a, to a lot more than just human Mars missions. Currently, we are looking at a nano uh, adept. A nano represents a very small adept. This is the size, this is a full scale model. And it can take two CubeSats inside, essentially. We can bring back, or we can put science samples uh, into Mars or Venus and run it. So this is what we are currently working on. And uh, we're going to be doing a flight test in year 15. And if you look at what we have done, we have gone from sub one meter scale, a two foot all the way to 23 meter, 25 meters, conceptually. They're very, very similar architecturally. The pieces are the same, the physics is the same. And so by testing at much smaller scale and applying it, we're gonna learn a lot and move forward. So in terms of summary, uh, 
Mars is both exciting and challenging, especially for humans if you want to do that. We have come to the end of the entry descent landing technology that today we have, and some of the technology investment happening today in this concept as well as the inflatable, they're going to allow us to go to Mars someday, soon. And the mechanically deployable specifically has the scalability, the ruggedness that we need, and all of those desirements that I talked about. That's how it's kept in mind. We have been designing and working on that. With that, I will. I thank you very much for your time and uh, listening to me. And I'm ready to answer any questions. So please raise your hand if you have uh, any questions. Well, this is fascinating. Um, the, the thought that occurs to me is you're making this carbon fiber fabric. It's not, not whether it will withstand atmospheric passage, but whether it will stand being folded up and opened if you fold it up, up and then move it to Mars for 11 months with all the conditions that it suffers, will it fall apart when you open it? Uh, very good question. So uh, the ground test article that I showed in that one picture, uh, we have done the deployment and uh, folding and unfolding of it multitude of times. Uh, Brian, uh, 70, 80 times. Yeah, something like that. We can do that with no, you know, seeable damage at all. But in space, we are going to only open it once. And we never close them and open them. So we fold it, launch it, and open it, and it's held in tension. It's those conditions during those eight months. You've got, you've it is got cold, temperature yes. radiation. So car yeah, carbon fiber and cold temperatures and hot temperatures. Carbon seems to be much more stable than any other material, but we haven't done the testing yet. But we will be, definitely. Uh, we, we use carbon in a lot of our TPS materials uh, as a basis for uh, what we know, carbon should not have a problem. But we have never, ever used a woven fabric in, a, in this form ever before. Uh, and, and that is something that we'll be doing. Fascinating stuff. So I presume the arc jets were set to test the Mars peak heating por uh, portions of the trajectory. Um, what about the, when the heating is less, but the drag and buffeting are strong? How uh, does it hold? Where is that in the trajectory, and how is it going to work? Have you tried that other wind tunnels and stuff? Right. Great, great question again. Uh, Any time you deploy something, <coughs> if it's not a rigid air shell, uh, you can imagine buffeting uh, inflatables and deployables. So what we do is we tension up the fabric. We put load into the fabric. And uh, if you do have time, uh, uh, let me know. And uh, Paul Dostinsky, who is the project manager sitting somewhere here, will arrange for people to come and visit. Once you load up the fabric, it gets to be as rigid as a rigid air shell. Carbon is a wonderful material. It doesn't strain much. It's very tough material. You can put some load. That's the very design. And also, hypersonically, open uh, configurations like this, they seem to be more stable. We did a, there was a flight test that was done for the hypersonic inflatable project called IRVI, and it came through uh, the hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic regimes with none of the problems, really. And this is uh, a much more uh, tensioned system compared to the inflatables as well. So we don't expect anything. But we'll be doing some testing in the big wind tunnels this year uh, and next year to understand, and the sounding rocket flight test I briefly flashed, that is another proof of 
those questions, we can retire very easily. Make sense? Okay. Hi. Um, have you thought about using this system in conjunction with an inflatable drag system for, re for entry? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, the carbon fabric uh, as a system, this system, would get us through the hypersonic phase very nicely from the large uh, deployment perspective. There's also another advantage to this. When you use carbon, you can use them repeatedly. You can do air capture, and then you cool down in space, and then come back and do entry, descent, landing, unlike inflatables. Inflatables, you have to think about that problem very seriously. But what we can do, and we haven't done it, that JPL is very interested in this, is to use this in conjunction with the supersonic parachutes that they are developing, they're gonna be flying in Hawaii, they were planning to fly, or the inflatable, that supersonic inflatable, that may provide a additional drag. Now what we have thought of is to do double deployment, one during air capture, and then one for entry, descent, landing, that will be a much larger surface, up to 33 meter diameter. For us to think about 23 meter if you think about, if you open your eyes and look above, at the ceiling height, 23 meters is larger than our eye can see. 33 meters is even larger. So thinking about those large systems start to hurt your brain until we go build things, and then it makes it easier. Okay, there was. So, so you mentioned testing this material um, in the peak heat load for a Mars and Venus EDL. Um, it looked, though, like you had the material pressed up against a cold soak of metal during the test. Um, has it been tested in a situation where it receives not only the thermal load of Mars EDL, but in this situation where there's nothing for, the, for it to reject the heat to other than the space behind it? Perfect observation there. Uh, the material that uh, the test article that you saw, it was a frame, like a picture frame where on the edge you're holding the, the fabric around a picture frame. In the middle of it, there's nothing behind. The flow can go through it. So even though I didn't show you that detail, uh, we have done testing at JSE ArcJet, at Ames ArcJet, at different conditions where the fabric allows the flow to go through if the flow penetrates the fabric. So it's very similar to what we do experience. It gets heated up to 2300 degrees Kelvin, 2200 to 2300 degrees, and then it radiates on both sides, and the frame definitely has an effect on keeping the fabric around the edge cooler, but the amount of heat we are putting in at the middle of the fabric, it is experiencing both thermal and mechanical loads. So it is a challenge for us to build those kinds of articles. This is the first time we have done that in the AIM, in the any arc jet, those kinds of loads, mechanical and thermal. So we call this a thermal mechanical test. Uh, that's, yes. So please join me in thanking Raj again for an excellent presentation. <laughs>